Hey there, Knicks fans. How you doing? It's your boy, John of the Macri with you for another episode of the Knicks Film School podcast. Um, we are working our way. We're past the dog days of the summer, I believe. It, it is. I don't know if it's officially summer. It's still the heat. It's still hot, but uh, it's not summer anymore, John. Let it's not summer anymore. That. No. Is that official? I thought so. <laughs> and, Andrew's shaking his head here. <laughs> September 21st. That's the, that's the uh, autumnal equinox. Oh, it's my daughter's birthday. I did not know her birthday was on the last day of summer. Yeah, it's either the 20th or the 21st. But for the sake of it, the bit still working, it's the 21st. Happy birthday, Scarlet Ray. Good start by me. Yes. Great start by you. We promise he's an expert at other things. <laughs> I'm on target. Yeah. <laughs> well, it feels appropriate that as we are working our way through summer, almost mm. done with summer and almost here at training camp, um, it feels like a while since I've just kind of gotten to talk a little basketball with the the man, the myth, the legend, the one and only Ben Ritholtz. How you doing? I'm great. I'm great. Enjoying late summer, obviously summer, <laughs> and uh, just uh, it was like 90 degrees yesterday. It's still it's, summer. It's very hot. It was a bad call by me. Um, and otherwise. Uh, enjoying Mitchell Robinson's tweets about cars and uh, various other meaningless basketball content that comes out this time of year. Uh, do you? I know what my answer to this is. Do you put any stock in any of the basketball? I'll, I'm going to put it. I'm going to do some huge air court energy here. Any of the basketball content that comes out during the summer. Very, very little. I was encouraged to see like when you get some looks at workouts, like real workouts, not like yeah. pickup games, which are totally meaningless. Yes. Um, and you see, like, for example, Julius Randall working on a little floater, which we really haven't seen. That's interesting to me. Like, that's interesting to see somebody working on a skill that might become relevant because he's going to play some more pick and roll and he's going to maybe be in that mid range spot and to be able to make that floater. That's interesting to me. It's a good call. Um, and not to say that it'll translate. We may never see him take a floater all season. Like, I don't know, but it's at least interesting to see him working on meaningful skills. And that that's the thing that his trainer decided. Right. And, obviously and you think these that guys they're are, working a lot. Yeah. And these guys are in console with the team, with the coaching staff, and it could be with directive. We don't really know. Um, but for sure, everyone's in contact over the course of the off season. Um, and like the contrast is Mitch, which is like most of it's comedy. <laughs> like what I like to see instead of uh, he's working most on his free, of it. He's working on his free throws. That's good. I mean, that's great. That's good. I don't think it looks any better, but okay, good. I, I would say I would, I would bet under 60% again, but just to hoping. Yeah. Would I would I like to see Mitch like would I like to see a workout where he's taking jump hooks? Yeah. That's not to say that he's not doing it just because it's not filmed and put on Twitter. So I'm not going to jump to any conclusions. Um, but I've had enough of the half court shots. And I would like to see a jump hook. Like, could can you score without dunking? I would that would be nice. But I'm not gonna assume that he's not doing that just because it's not on Twitter. That's my point. So very little stock with like very few exceptions. If I see an interesting skill that they're working on that I think would be valuable or would translate. Um, I like to see that stuff if I get someone, access to it. Someone reached out to me. I think it was in uh, an email to the to the Gmail account, or it might have been on Twitter. I don't know. Somebody reached out to me at some point. Maybe it was actually just uh, like in my mentions about like, am, am I worried that we haven't seen RJ in any videos with teammates? Like, the, like you know, Brunson and I guess Randall and I feel like Obi and they've been on guys. the circuit. I yeah. do. Yeah. Yeah. They've yeah. Been on the circuit. Doing, doing all the things. And RJ is, is, seems to not be there. Um, showing up at schools in, in Brooklyn and uh, interviews with Monica McNutt. Shout out to Monica. Um, Just came out with a shoe. Uh, yes. A Puma shoe. Mm. That was nice. Why I, not? <laughs> I'm, of the apparel that dropped this week, I'm a little bit more excited about the City Edition jerseys, which I kind of dig. Um, than I am about the boomer shoes, but, uh, but I digress. Uh, and so, but anyway, somebody asked me, like, am I worried that he's not in any of these videos? And I, I choose to believe that he's just in the lab working on like a discrete skill 
this summer and he's going to come back next year and it's we're going to be like, oh, it's clear what RJ has been working on for the last three months. But I don't I don't know how true that is. Yeah, I'd also say that uh, he had a very different summer in terms of where he is in his career and like the contract and the extension and yeah. and he was hurt too or he was like recovering from injury or whatever it was. Yeah, so like he didn't know he was going to be on the team. He didn't he hadn't signed an extension, there were trade talks like I and I know IQ and I Obi were also in the trade conversations, but like I I don't know, I feel like this was a very like important personal summer for RJ, so I'm not going to like I don't blame him for not hanging out and pick up games. Um very very fair. I also have zero other than that one Tibbs comment which was interesting, which is up to interpretation as to which what, comment is this when he said something about RJ working, that was kind of ambiguous whether oh, yeah. he was calling him out for not working could have been read in a couple different ways. I remember you oh. thinking that it was more intentional than others thought almost ended my friendship with one Andrew Claudio, but we, we, we persevered. That's right. Yeah. So other than that, I have zero evidence. Um, and I have a lot of contrary evidence that RJ does work very hard. Um, we know his trainer, um, I feel like he's probably to the extent that he can be working, he's work, probably working. Um, so I, uh, yeah, I'm not, uh, I don't take much stock in the fact that he's not hanging out with teammates this summer. Yeah. Um, neither do I, uh, I, I don't take, I like you don't take stock in any of this other than the fact that Mitchell Robinson continues to <laughs> march to the beat of his own drummer. Um, so much money. <laughs> You know, it's funny. So I wrote, I wrote about this in the newsletter this week and it, I don't know why it took me. So I think it probably took me so long to get to this point because I just didn't, I I don't usually spend a lot of time thinking about things that I know are not going to happen. um, And especially things that can't happen in the immediate future. But like for the first time in the last several days, I really started thinking about like, well, why is why is Mitchell Robinson the best option as the, in particular, the starting center for this team? And then I was reminded when I looked at the contract, I'm like, oh, that's right. This contract is going to take up over 14 or about 14% of the salary cap this year in four years or three years, whatever the last year of the contract, it's going to take up like 8.8% of the salary cap. Um, so this guy, I mean, I know it's a lot of money. I agree with you. It's a lot of money. The, the amount of money is going to seem a lot less because the contract's going down, the cap's going up. So true. From that perspective, I, I, I yeah, it's a lot of money this year. It's going to look like kind of a lot of money next year. Anyway, I'm getting off uh, off topic. I, I, there were a few things I wanted to get your opinion on, and the first is that, which is that, and I, I have another newsletter coming out for for Wednesday about my ideal like rotation and whatnot. And every time I keep coming back to it, you could put Randall on the team. You could take Randall off the team. I keep coming back to the same thing. It's just like, man, I feel like Hardenstein makes more sense with this starting lineup. And I like, don't want to talk about it because it's obviously not going to happen. They're not going to be- like put, take Mitch off the bench, but just like from a purely theoretical perspective, am I, am I crazy here? Not crazy. You wouldn't be crazy to say Hardenstein's just a better player. Um, yeah. Yeah. I-, I think it's pretty close. Um, the reason I push back on that and I actually like Hartenstein off the bench is because there is so much usage in that starting lineup as it is. Mm -hmm. And to try to balance Brunson, RJ and Julius Randall, assuming even Grimes start, I mean, Grimes and Fournier are going to basically play the same role. I mean, Fournier is not going to get a ton of pick and roll reps. He'll get a couple of game. Um, Grimes won't get any probably, um, which is another reason why Grimes might make sense in the starting lineup for the same reason. Yeah. You're not maximizing Hartenstein if he's just a screener and roller. Like that's a good call. You really want to see him be able to initiate some offense from the elbows. I don't think there's really room in terms of, uh, usage in terms of on ball reps for him to really have a, have a meaningful role doing that in the starting lineup. So to me, I actually think I really like inserting him in that second unit, which is already so dynamic, but you have some more intuitive ball players, cutters like Obi, who would get to play yeah. with Hartenstein. Julius isn't known for his off ball movement. Let's put it that way. Um, Maybe that's what he's working on. Not on video. He's just running around the court. 
Yeah. And not to say that Julius can't cut. I think he's kind of gone away from it. I think he, as his usage has gone, you know, has, has skyrocketed the last couple yeah. of years. Um, but Obi is such a great cutter. Uh, IQ is just a more intuitive player. Brunson's a really good, I mean, Brunson's really smart. RJ, I think his cutting is underutilized. I'd like, as we've always said, I'd like to see him on the second unit a little bit. If you could carry him over to play with Hartenstein and let him cut off of Hartenstein at the elbow, but just like kind of with Julius out there, Brunson and RJ need their, you know, need a large share of the pick and roll reps. I actually think Mitch just being the diver, low usage diver that he is makes a lot of sense. Yes, of course. Yes. I agree with everything you said. I just can't, there are a few things that I can't get away from, which is the the notion of, despite what we're seeing in workout videos from Mitchell Robinson, this is still a player who no one cares about anything he's doing if it's more than four feet from the basket. Uh, and that's one. And two, it's the thing that, again, and it always comes back to Julius, the notion that Julius is still probably going to be on this team, him and Mitch, like, it's not that they... They haven't been able to function together. Obviously, they've played a ton of minutes together over the last three years. And like some of those minutes have been quite good. But it's pretty clear that like that is not, you know, a partnership that is destined for great things, I don't think. Um good thing so I guess that's both for three plus years, guaranteed. You, you really <laughs> love these contracts. <laughs> <laughs> you do. Um but my so my my workaround, but then so I have two things to push back, not push back, but like two thoughts in response. One, the bench, it's not like the bench doesn't have high usage guys too. If Derek Rose is still gonna be on this team, mm-hmm. if Evan Fournier is gonna be off the bench, if Emmanuel quickly, who everybody wants to get more on ball reps, right, is gonna be coming off the bench, and then there's Obi Toppin. So it's like I I don't know, I guess you maybe do 20, 20, 20. 2020 usage, you know, across the board. I don't know. I don't know how that works. The only other thought that I had was like, because I always fundamentally come back to, again, assuming Randall's going to be on the team, Randall, RJ, Bronson, how much can you stagger the minutes of those three guys? And I I feel like that is a good thing. I don't know if it's going to be possible if the team doesn't make any moves, but I, I wonder, is that part of a solution? You know, um, Again, I'm going away from the the hardened side thing, but like I don't know. This is these are all the things that I keep coming back to about trying to trying to solve problems with this team. Yeah, I do think Hardenstein is going to close some games, and I think it'll be oh, yeah. a bit, it'll be a bit matchup dependent, um, and who the opposing center is. I feel like while both are great rim protectors, and it's, and it's statistically Hardenstein's a better even a better rim protector. Yeah. I don't know if I really. I know the stats say that. I don't know if I really believe that against like explosive athletic centers, if I think Hartenstein uh, protects the rim better than Mitchell Robinson, who is as elite an athlete at the center position as, as the league has. And Hartenstein, great positionally, really smart, underrated athletically. He's not unathletic, but he's certainly a bit, you know, he, he's a bit plodding out there. He's and, like Benji Ritholtz. Not unathletic. Well, I, I don't know what to say about that. Um, <laughs> I don't know what to say about that. He's more athletic than I am. I, who never dunked in a basketball game in my life. Um, but he, um, depending on the matchup, I think he will close games. And I, I, while you're right that Derek Rosen quickly are also high usage, they're more intuitive ball movers and connectors. Like Rose, I think, has really proven that. Like, yes. He's able to get off ball and be and serve more as a connector and a driving kick guy um, when he when he's kind of put in that position. And he's really, really smart, like an underrated part of Derek Rose's game. He's just a really smart basketball player. I think the second unit as a whole and the reason that we enjoy watching the second unit so much yeah. is because of how well the ball moves. And Hartenstein only adds to that and and um, and amplifies it. Um, and I, I just I, I like that a lot. Um, but that said. Maybe the first unit, uh, to your point, the starting unit could maybe use some of that and and Hartenstein's passing and be able to connect on the short roll. That that to me, by the way, might be the best argument for for him in the starting lineup is the short roll inability of Mitch, which has really hurt the Knicks against trapping defenses, specifically whether it be Miami or when Brooklyn gets aggressive, um, Toronto, 
the inability to hit Mitch on a short roll when they trap and they will trap Brunson and they will trap RJ. But that's a closing thing to your point before yeah. about as uh, that's less worried about first five minutes of the game, first five minutes of the, of the I, second half. I agree half. with that. I yeah. agree with that. Yeah. And it's so right. And, and you can, and you could base your, your personnel on how teams are defending. And, and I think the, the cool thing I would look, I, I, I pushed back a bit on the amount of money given to the center position. I think it's a bit for this team and where they are. I think it's a bit crazy. I struggle to get upset when you sign good basketball players. So I'm like, I'm kind of on the fence as to whether I would have done that. The nice thing about the two headed center monster that they have, and that's forgetting about Jericho Sims, I was, who, we know, who we know is capable. And I'm going to bring it back to Sims in a second. Yeah. We'll continue. Yeah. So the nice thing about it is they, they do some things. Well, they, they share some good attributes in terms of rim protection, defensive ability, but they do things differently too. And they, and they, they complement, like they, they provide different looks against different defenses, against different personnel. And, you know, Tibbs has that at his disposal, which I think is a really good thing in terms of winning games this year. Like, I think it's a really nice luxury to have. It's not. Yeah, that's the thing. It's not a two headed center. I really do think you have to consider Sims and the fact that they got him now locked up on a three year deal. It just go. It reinforces what me and Jeremy were talking about a little bit on the, on the last episode, which is like. The notion that, yes, Mitch is here right now and Mitch is going to be here until at least January 15th. But and then if you throw in the OB piece of this, which is, you know, the thing that'll put Andrew in an early grave one of these days, if I keep talking about it enough, OB, OB getting minutes at the five, um, you know, that that is at least a thing that is still out there that is talked about um, for as long as at the, especially for as long as Julius Randle's going to be on this team. Um yeah, I don't know. And then I always go back to what you said. I forget what pot it was on. I forget exactly how long ago, but like, is Tibbs just trying to break even with the starters? Yeah. And win it. Because if that is, the, if that has always been the plan, and if that's how he thinks is the best chance to win games, and yeah, you can be damn sure that Isaiah Harnstein is going to be playing with that second unit because, man, that, that's the best. They were already probably the best second unit. In the NBA, maybe them great, or like, I don't know. It's a great second unit. It's a great second unit. It's one of the best yeah. in the league. It is. And so, you know, how many minutes can they share the court for? How many minutes can like the, you know, four of them at a time share the court for? How many minutes can like three of them at a time share the court for? I don't know. These are all, I think, the questions I keep coming back to. And it makes it makes the conversation that Jeremy and I tried to have the other day about like, what do we need to happen? What do we want to happen? Like, what would I deal like in terms of moves the team makes, especially it makes it complicated um, because there are a lot of ways that they go about doing things. That's what, that's really what I wanted to get to is like, is there anything that you feel like with the roster, the way it is now, you're like, this needs to change by this point, whether it's by the opening of training camp, whether it's, you know, within, 30 games of the season, whether it's by the trade deadline, like, is it, is there one or two things that you really want to see happen in whether it's a trade, whether it's just somebody getting at being out of here? Yeah, I mean, the obvious one. Is, so I, I assume we're, we're putting Julius Randle getting traded aside. Cause I, that, that is the most obvious. So that is still um, clearly number one for you. That is clearly number one. Okay. Like, because it addresses the other stuff that I care about, which is, Obi Toppin needs to play, God, minimum 20 minutes. I would like to see 25. It cannot be 12. And like, cannot be 12. It cannot be 12. You can't look, you just, I don't want, we've spoken enough about the Donovan Mitchell trade or lack thereof, but you can't hold back the young players because you value them and then not value them when it comes to playing time. That's contradictory. That's bad business. That makes no sense. It won't be. T- it, there's, there is no way. Talk about famous last words. There is no way that it could be twelve or even for like. I was looking before, and I, I have some of this in the Wednesday newsletter about players who played under thirty minutes a game last year. And you look at some of the names of players who averaged under thirty minutes a game last year. There are guys who are like not not all stars, but like you know. Look at Memphis. Talk about a team that knows how to deploy its guys to, and get the most out of the players on his roster. Desmond Bain, 
Jaron Jackson Jr., both of those, and I know Jackson has some foul issues, but like neither of those guys averaged 30 minutes a game. Wow, Bain didn't. That, that's a great, I did not he, know that. It was a hair under. It was like but 29. That's still shocking. Because that's seven, a guy yeah. that you figure, if Tibbs had Desmond Bain, a two way, <laughs> a two way wing, he'd break Will Chamberlain. He'd be at least 37 point. minutes a game. <laughs> yeah. That's um, shocking. Wow. That yeah. is shocking. You know, Utah, but neither neither Bogdanovich nor Conley averaged 30 minutes a game. Um, Conley's old. I get that. Bogdanovich is more shocking. Um, but but yeah, you know, like, I, again, they're a loaded roster, but they also had a lot of injuries last year. Marcus Morris in L.A. did not average 30 minutes a game. And like, there's a, there's other guys. But like the notion that Julius Randle, like, ha, like 30 minutes a game for him with the addition of Brunson. And like with the Obi thing out there, like if they would go to him and like, listen, Julius, uh, on a, when when everybody's healthy, you're gonna play 30. Obi's gonna miss some games. When he misses games, you'll play your 34, your 36, your 38, whatever it is. Yeah. But but when <laughs> or play RJ at the four, I don't, I don't need Julius playing 38. But okay, I hear you. Yeah. Uh, but if it's if it's about selling it to Julius, sure, sure, sure. Yeah. It's like you're gonna look up. At the end of the year, and you're going to you're going to be on the like when you sort the NBA play traditional stats page by minutes per game, like you're going to be on the first page and you're going to be right in line with some other guys who you feel like you are on par with. We will we will get you there. But on a in a night where everybody's healthy, it's going to be about 30. And if you get then that leaves 18 for Obi. And then if you do a couple, you know, three, four, five minutes a game with the with the both of them together, that's your. That's your OB, right? That's your OB target. Yep. So anyway, I'm yeah, sorry to go exactly, off on that. I, I, Zach, Zach, Zach Lowe laid it out yes. in terms of getting them right. He had a great kind of formula as to how you get to whatever he said, 25. What did he say? 20 or 25? I, don't I know. think he was getting to, yeah, about 24, 25. It, it, that, it, there, this is like a, it's obvious. It, it needs to happen. It's if they can't trade him. Um, so yeah, that was the original premise. So assuming so I they guess can't this would be Julius. number two would be... If you don't trade Julius Randle, Obi Toppin needs to get minimum 20 minutes a game. I'd like more than that, but okay. I'm realistic with who the coach is and Julius is making a whole lot of money and I get it to some extent, but he's got to play. That would be my number two. So out. So it's funny that both of your, your one and your two are focused essentially in the same area. Is there a gap between those two and whatever yes. your next most impressed? Okay. So what's, what's after that? Sorry, or is there a, something that there's a there. gap between one and two? Is that what your question was? I mean, oh, no. Julius, okay. Julius okay. getting out of here. <laughs> it's and one. I'm not even discounting the fact that he could have a bounce back year. I'm really not. I just don't think it really makes sense to have him on a four year extension with the current personnel, what the team is trying to accomplish. I, I don't, that doesn't, it doesn't really make any sense. I, I, I just don't. That's that, that to me is like way up priority number one. Speaking of Zach Lowe, he, his shout out to him and a uh, friend of the pod, both of the friends of the pods, Chris Herring. Had Hell a pod yeah, both of them help friends of the pod. Look at you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, it's uh, Listen, life in Nick's film school is good. I, I, I'm not complaining. Um, they, uh, on their pod today, in which they were going through some uh, fake Phoenix trades. Yeah, I heard he, this. Yes, he he said the name Julius Randle and he essentially he very quickly was like, I just, I can't, the shooting's not there enough. Dismissed um, out of hand. But the fact that he said the name, because <laughs> you had the sons, I forget the name. I'm sorry of who you had on from the sons who was like super enthusiastic about the idea. Uh, Sam, Sam Cooper. I Sam believe, yes. Cooper. Thank you. Sorry, Sam. And, uh, and Zach, Zach was definitely less enthusiastic about it from a sense perspective, <laughs> but uh, which I, yeah. I get that. But like, as but then from that part of the conversation, he's going to like, you know, maybe make a, a godfather offer to SGA. I think that what I took from that conversation is, is outside of maybe the the obvious name of Bogdanovich. I don't think there is an obvious name for the Suns. And if Danny Ainge is out there demanding, God knows, I don't know what the hell he's demanding for Bogdanovich. Like. Are they just going to stay status? I like I. It's 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 far fetched. I agree. It's far fetched. Anyway, I uh, enough talking about trading Julius. So after trading Julius, and there's a gap, <laughs> and then getting Obi more time. Is there yes. anything else after that that is either even semi important to you? Like I need this to happen, or I really want this to happen. There's a lot of stuff that's important to me. Uh, <laughs> um, Tibbs keeping his beard. 
into the I like the, the beard. He got some I, you you like know, the beard? I have no problem with the beard. I don't know. I, look. He needs a fresh start. It was a rough year, you know. Typically fresh start means you shave the beard. Well, what other options does he have? What's, Andrew shaking his head. I, see, I'm thinking about like Chris. What's I, the, Tim's working with? You know what I mean? A fresh start is just something new. Like a That's new right. haircut. You That's grow right. out a beard. I, I, I like it. I like yeah. it for Tim's. When, um, when Captain America went into hiding for two years. <laughs> what did he do? He grew, <laughs> he grew, grew a beard. the beard. Yeah. Uh, then, you know. Is Tim's going into hiding? It's a change of identity. You know? I, I think this Fine. summer might have been his arrested after the fight at the airport. And then, oh. you know, Ant-Man broke him out of jail. And I guess he was the one that broke everybody out of jail. And um, shout out Captain Civil War. Um, point being, the beard is a fresh start. for It's him. a fresh start. OK. Yeah. Well, anyway, I, I, what else would I say? So I, I think if you can get I think this stuff is basically now off the table at least in terms of Fournier, if you can get off of one of Rose or Fournier. Okay. I would love to get off of Fournier. I don't really think that's feasible right now. Um, I think I the initial so trade was the, was the way to do it. Um, and I love Derek Rose. I just, again, in terms of where we are and, and they're not going to trade Derek Rose. So it's not, again, not really going to happen. If they could get off of one of those guys to just kind of clear space for IQ to make sure that IQ gets those minutes that I think he should be getting somewhere between 25 and 30 a game um, to be like a true six man that like just can finish games, plays a whole lot of the game. Um, that would be great. Uh, that's a little bit less realistic. I think. Um, can, can I give you my issue with the Rose thing? Yeah. And like, I, I from a philosophical, th- philosophical slash theoretical point of view, I, I it's, it makes all the sense in the world that he is not here. Here's what I here's where I struggle. Ostensibly, the Knicks or Tom Thibodeau and the front office and whatever else are looking at the players on this team and being like, "We're going to go out there. We're going to make the playoffs this year, guys. We're going to. It's going to happen. We're going to. We're going to make it happen. Okay, great. I, yes, of course. Good luck. But like, it's they're they the the players on this team. I don't believe are going into this training camp with the mentality of let's say the players on the Thunder. Or oh, oh, the rocket. Spending, there's way too much money in this team to be thinking that way. Yeah. So that's that's my point. If you then take Derrick Rose, who is especially now with Taj gone, I think the only like the only thing really they have that's like a vet leader, mm-hmm. who's also been arguably the best player on the team. I, I actually, I, would say, I actually think Fournier. I don't know what to the degree to which like the team listens to him, and he doesn't have, uh, the, same, he doesn't have the same cachet. Well, as Derek one's a Rose. former MVP. <laughs> And is no, hundred percent. I just, yeah. I, I do want to say, I think he's a really good locker room guy. I feel okay. like he's, uh, whatever. Anyway, that's yeah. fair. But Derek Rose, former MVP, arguably the best player. If you take the past two years in totality, you can make an argument that when he has played, Derek mm-hmm. Rose has still been the best player. Like yep. to take that guy and be like, we're going to, you know, we're, whatever we're going to, we're going to trade him for, it, an expiring contract of a player that we're then going to waive and like a future second round. Like, I just, I wonder what kind of a message that sends to your team. And I wonder if it is worth, again, it's a stupid conversation because we're not going to, we, we all know they're not going to do this, but just in theory, if they, if they were so inclined to consider it, I wonder the message it sends to the team. And if the, if the, if the negatives outweigh the positives, I, I just, I don't know the answer to that, but that's what I struggle with. That's very fair. That's very fair. I I feel like considering the fact that he won't I, from a leader from a veteran veteran leadership perspective, I totally agree. I think Brunson brings a certain professionalism and calm demeanor, some of which like that that kind of can take some of that Rose role, which is what Rose is, right? He's like the very calm demeanor <laughs> leadership. Uh, doesn't they also have a connection, by the well. way. Don't forget, dating back to when, like, uh, what his dad was an assistant coach in Chicago. Like, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. it's, it's uh. but you're right. I think he's fundamental to what they're trying to be. He's he preaches the gospel of Tibbs. He has a relationship with a lot of the you know the front office. I, I, I get it. It's the family thing, and I don't. That's why I don't really think it's going to happen. Even if I even understanding your point, I still think makes a lot of sense. Um, I'd like to see Cam get a shot. 
Yeah. I didn't like, think you were going to say that. No, a hundred percent. Why? Um, Maybe that seems obvious, but I, I want to well, hear you say it. Why? I guess two different levels of reasons. I mean, from a organizational perspective, you, you, you spent the first round pick to get this guy. Yep. Um, and I don't think like you could like write it off as a sunk cost. He hasn't gotten enough of an opportunity for that. Um, so it's not like the agree. reason. So like uh, you spent the front, you know, again, good business is giving this guy a chance, showing me that the front office and the head coach are on the same page <laughs> because that whole thing was weird. How it went down um, was is. Yeah. And like I. So he's also extremely young and has a lot of talent. That's uh, that's clear. And actually, I thought overall his Nick, when he got a chance to play, I thought he did well. I really do. It was such a limited opportunity that it's hard to even like judge the mistakes that he made, which were, you know, he did make some mistakes, but like overall, I thought he was impressive and, and contributed to the team when he got a chance. And like, he also, in, the team is really small at the guard position, fairly small on the wing because they play, yeah. They're going to play a lot of two-point guard lineups. Like having a guy with his size on the wing who has his defensive capabilities. Now, I want to see him, those capabilities come to fruition. But again, I think he showed enough flashes. He's got a, he's got a great basketball body. He's really big wing. He could play some four. Like, I think it's not just that I want to see him. So like on one level, it's like front office spent the first round pick on this guy. He needs to get a chance. Yeah. And then on a, from a winning games perspective, like, I think he can really help this team. I think he can really cover up some of the deficiencies of this team. Um, it would also be, can you imagine if they, if they basically did trade him as like a throw, not a throw in, in a, I don't, cause I don't think it'll be a throw in, but I like, if there's a trade to be had involving, let's say Randall or Fournier and Cam is involved in it to, let's say, facilitate the trade or, they get really desperate and they trade him for like, you know, a, a, a fake first that is really, they're trading him for like a couple of seconds. Um, and he goes somewhere, whether it's LA or wherever else. And he like, blow, that blows up. Like but even if he just, if he looks kind of the part of the player that was supposed to be drafted would that would be, again, I'm not saying it would be a death knell to the front office, but that would be probably the worst look that they've had. So far. So for, uh, I think that's another thing you could add to the list of reasons why. Absolutely. Give him yeah. a chance. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Um, so, yeah, I, I you know, what, what is he right now? Would you say he's the 10th man right now that could or could not be in the rotation? Oh, I think he's the 11th man. He's the 11th. Go he's through it. Man. You have you have the two. Right. So you have. So if the starting Brunson, lineup is Grimes Brunson. and then IQ and Rose are four kind of guards wings. Then you have RJ and Fournier. Yep. And then you have Obi Randall. Yeah, he, doesn't, I, he doesn't have a spot, right? He doesn't have a spot. The, the thing I've been the, the most amazed by this summer is it feels like people are slowly coming to grips with the possibility that Cam is outside of the rotation. There's no, there's no, there's no question. He is outside. Of the I rotation. don't know why I forgot. Yeah. So the, another reason, yeah. by the no, way, I'm like, not saying you because another were, reason why yeah. getting off Fournier is important because that would be his. They're they're just see to me. I'm looking at it from an asset valuation perspective. I think getting off of Four, I think Fournier. The notion of trading Fournier is should be after trading Julius and after trading Rose because I think his value will increase every day, like every additional day. Evan Fournier's value will will increase and it'll make it more much easier to trade the further we go. Whereas Julius, I think, is a distinct possibility. It's going to cost whatever it's going to cost to get rid of him today versus same as it will three months so, from now. Right, come the trade deadline this year. Evan Fournier will have a year and a half remaining okay, fully guaranteed money left on the books. Uh, I'm not saying that they're, anyone's going to give up anything for him, but to I'm not either that, that a team in the, that a playoff team wouldn't take a chance. I, I, you have to match salary anyway. So they're going to be giving up some salary, like to take a chance on a guy that can shoot the ball like him. I'm not Look at, Heald. Look at how Heald's contract was viewed. I, a hundred a year ago or a, a year and a half ago versus how it's viewed now. It's a hundred percent. I'm yeah. not counting out that possibility, whether it's Milwaukee has a couple of injuries on the wing and they can kind of Milwaukee's a team that can kind of can, can absorb his defensive limitations because of how good their backline defense is like yeah. Grayson Allen though. is a decent defender, but like 
Right. But let's say they're not they're They have a lot of wings who are like decent to good. They don't have like Fournier would be by far their best um, spot up shooter. Uh, Middleton, but like he's a star, but like yeah. kind of like off the like they could use his shooting. Oh, him 18 minutes a game for Milwaukee. That's what I mean. Like makes a big difference. Like think about what Boston tried to do with him. It didn't quite work in Boston for various reasons because he was also paired with Kemba, which, oh, well, let's try that also with the Knicks. That was ingenious. But <laughs> but like if he's your worst defender and you can play him off the bench to be a shooter who can get hot. I mean, he's a, he's a good basketball player. Like he can help you. So once 100%. right, you're hundred percent right. Like I, it might, it might be more of a trade deadline thing. Cause as you say, the less time on that contract, the more valuable it is, yeah. but he's not a negative player. He can help a team. There's no question. He can help a team. And also I think a team at the deadline can look at it. Cause there, there are so many, and this is the other thing. There are so many teams that are slated to have money like real money to spend like something close to around half the league this upcoming summer. And the reality is there's just, I, I think it could be a dangerous summer, not 2016 dangerous, but like danger zone, bad contract dangerous where I wonder if some team looks at 40 and is like, you know what, rather than go out and have to spend more years and like equally not great money on whoever they think they might be able to get. Why don't we just, make our signing now and like trade an expiring contract, you know, for Fournier and like, we don't, and that's, and that's, I don't know. Um, and by the way, yeah, it's not so. just, it's not just the, it's not just the, the, um, the years that are running out that make it more valuable. The cap's going to go up. And so it's going to be, it's going to be more, it's going to be a more valuable contract every, every, every year. Um, or the, the, the next, but year. that, but that so. doesn't solve. And it's expiring uh, in a year. It'll be expiring. Yeah. yeah. But that doesn't solve your cam problem right now, no. and I, I mean, I haven't even talked about Deuce. I'm not. I, I know me and you are not as worried about Deuce as some other people. But um, yeah, no, I don't know. I I, I I think I have no problem with Deuce playing the year in Westchester and getting better. Like I, yeah. that to me is fine. I'm I'm I, fine with that as well. Yeah, I mean, again, I, dating back before we got Brunson when the season ended. Would I have been totally okay had the Knicks just not picked up Brunson, not picked up Hartenstein, and basically just rolled with their young guys plus Julius if they couldn't get off of him and Fournier? Probably. Yeah. Like I am not. This offseason basically in the end was neutral to negative. I mean, forgetting about Mitchell, just in terms of who they picked up and like where they are as a team. Like, would I have signed Brunson to all that money and signed Hartenstein and signed Mitch to all that money? Probably not like based on where we are. I think we're spending a lot of money for a lot of mediocrity right now. And I really like Jalen Brunson. I really like Isaiah Hartenstein. I'm going to, I'm excited to watch them play. But yeah. if I'm thinking like organizationally, directionally, it, I don't know if it really made all that much sense other than to be competitive and try to well, be in the play in fridge. I, I get that approach. I, I, I feel like I would have been okay if Deuce was the ninth man on this team. Okay, I just would have if what Brunson wasn't signed or and Cam would have been more, you know. Um, he would, I think, Deuce Cam in that would, case, Cam and Deuce would still be fighting it out probably for number 10. It would be well, Brunson's the interesting spot. thing there is how desperate would they have been to get rid of Alec Burks' salary mm. if they I forgot, I forgot about him? Would, yeah. Um, yeah, so that's fair. I don't know, it, it, it's complications anyway. Look, uh, last thing, and then I know Andrew wants to get a quick word in. Um, so like that. What you just said about where they are at as an organization is what, in a weird way, prompted me to have one of my things that I think I said I needed slash really wanted, whatever, I forget, on the last episode, which is that I just don't want them to win some number of games in the mid-30s. If like if you're going to be good, like be good enough that it's like something to really... Give us something to hope for. You know, like what whatever it... I, I, I trust that if this team wins 40 or more games enough important, meaningful things will have gone right that I could look at it and be like, okay, there's something here we could work with. And if you're not going to get to that point, <laughs> have your win total start with a two and at least give us a, a chance in with the ping pong balls. Are you, are you in that same kind of boat? Yeah. Um, I am in that boat. I also feel like it just it it depends on what it looks like. Like I can live with mid thirties 
if the basketball is exciting, if the young guys are really getting a chance, if you're increasing the value of your young guys. Okay. That's fair. If it looks like last season, that's my, well, it, my implication is like, it would, it would, you know, like Julius would be here the whole time and like be playing a decent like, amount. Of it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, to me, like uh, the young guys can all play pretty well and this team could still realistically win 35 games. It's possible. hundred percent. I, I think it's unlikely because I think they're, I shouldn't say it's a lot. I think it's more likely that if the young guys all click and they get the playing time that I think they will win more games than that. Um, but it's not, it's not, it's, it's feasible that they could all play pretty well. And if Julius is bad enough uh, and if, and if the, the small backcourts kind of don't translate to a top 10 defense this year, and like it's, it's, it's possible that they are, that they win 35, 36, 37 games. But if, if, if it's exciting basketball and the players values are, 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 are raised and they look good and they like, I could live with that. I wouldn't be, but if it looks like last year that I, and they win 35 games, that's a, that's disaster. an utter disaster. That's an utter okay. disaster. Cause then you're not raising anybody's value and you're only lowering people's value. Cause and and yeah. and and you're not and you're mid lottery, you know your ninth, tenth, eleventh, twelfth pick. What does that get you? You know, really very little. It is really pretty much that is the only thing that they cannot do. So I guess that's good news. There are a lot of different ways you could go. Several of them are good, and I mean, if they can get in the play in race, if they I, the fans will get super excited about that if they're a good, exciting, fun team I, that's that's scrapping like, oh god, I mean, how fun, you watched New Orleans last year in that play? Oh, like, great. That was lit. Andrew keeps bringing that up, and they won. And that team, as Andrew likes to point out, won 36 games. I'm never going to be upset that they're trying to win games as long as it, like, that's what I mean. Like, I, what I've done this offseason, maybe not, but I'm not going to begrudge it. And I'm like happy to watch good players play basketball. Um, you got to do it the right way. And, and if you're competing and trying to win and getting the garden excited and the fans excited, that's, you know, that's certainly someone like analyzing the games has to watch, you know, watching the games multiple times, trying to study, like, I'd love to watch good basketball. Like good basketball is fun. It's, anything could be better than last year. Uh, yes. a- Andrew, how you doing? Hi, John. Hi, Benji. Hello, sir. I'm not great, by the way, if that's the actual answer to your question. Benji Oh, uh, Hold on. I need to... Do I need to check a, a baseball score? Uh, the New York Mets have scored two runs in the last two days against the last place Chicago Cubs. I'm actually not even sure if they are the last place Chicago Cubs because they... Uh, scored one run a week ago against the last place Pittsburgh Pirates. Point being is that um, as Mets fans that are listening to this will understand, we've been trying to compare this to what great season this compares to. And some have gone as far as to say this is 86 all over again, or at least 2006. Um, This is 2007 where they waited until September to blow that big lead. Uh, Granted, they didn't have like the greatest second place team ever chasing them. Like, (laughs) This is this is getting infuriating that they're about to be five. I will, six, John. Is this what you expected when you handed it to Andrew? No, Sorry. but I I do. You asked. You asked. Okay, no, listen, you there, asked. There are a lot of baseball references as, as listeners to the show well know by now that I that will go right over my head. One of a sports day that I will never forget as long as I live is mm-hmm. the Glavin oh, start. Yep. Which I did. He last. You just made it one, out of the first just, inning. No, he got one out. One of the great oh, days. One yeah, of the great right. days I can remember. One, what was it like one seven out, nothing or eight? Seven nothing, nothing or, after first seven after the first inning. That's right. And I thought I thought he I'm got, I I couldn't remember if he got one out or four outs. I I knew he I knew he left with an out in the inning, but I thought it was the second inning. Hall of Famer, one of the greatest Atlanta Braves ever, killed the Mets his entire career, including when he played. For him. <laughs> <laughs> he was good that year, though, if I, if I recall correctly. He was most fine. He got his 300th win and then decided his career was over. The problem is that the <laughs> season wasn't over. The season wasn't over, yeah. Anyway, yeah. What, what did you want to talk to Benji about? <laughs> oh, yeah. Speaking of frustrating things. So, Benji, mm. I want on the record, first of all, how usually unimpeachable your work is uh, how much knowledge you <laughs> provide to Nick's film school. Like one this? of the first things that I said before you even with Nick's film school, and we were, I think it was like an, a, a Christmas thing or an end of year thing where we were all saying nice things about each other. And it was like, anytime I go to a Benji Ritholtz thread, I learn something. And that is a fact you are, yeah. One of the smarter basketball this is minds. A long and one of the preface to a big butt. But <laughs> a couple of weeks ago, you, me, and Jeremy sat here and we discussed what our biggest sports 
disappointments were. Mm. And I told you what was my biggest Knicks disappointment ever. My most heartbreaking Knicks moment. John knows this. John, what is my biggest Knicks heartbreak ever? Oh, wait. Uh, hold on. I may. I'm not, I'm not sure I know this. So it's I, not. It's not nine. It's not mellow because. Yeah, I know it's not mellow. It's something that's from close. like the late 90s. So it's not the 99 team. Is it's, it 97? It is the 1997 nine men, one mission. Because I suspensions. was right. I was convinced that that team was better than the Miami Heat. I was convinced that was their best shot at Jordan. They spent the entire first half of the 90s without enough offense. <laughs> and they're trying to have a dog fight like the Pistons did. And they never could get over the hump. And then you come into 1997. They had Allen Houston. They had Charlie Ward. They had Larry Johnson. And they've got the firepower to go up against the Bulls. Split the season series with the Bulls, including the that. only victory in the United Center by, by, by an opposing team. The Bulls had, I think, okay, two losses, I think, at home that year. The Knicks were one of them. And I thought that was the year. They're up 3-1 against the Miami Heat. P.J. Brown pulls this cheap shot flip of Charlie Ward. Patrick Ewing and Allen Houston take one step off the bench, and they're suspended for game six. And then the Knicks... Again, nine men, one mission was the nickname of this game. The Knicks, unfortunately, needed at least 10 men and lost 95-90. And then they go to game seven. One of the first real sports heartbreaks of my life mm -hmm. because the New York Knicks went up against the now Hall of Famer, Tim Hardaway, who went to the tune of 38 Tim points. Yeah, Tim Hardaway Sr., excuse me, um, who went to the tune of 38 points. And even so, the Knicks only lost by 11 with a suspended John Starks and Larry, Larry Johnson game on the bench. I just and the problem, the game I know you close. just watched it. it and the blowout. problem I have with Benji <laughs> is that I had to relive this <laughs> through a Knicks film thread the other day. All right. Explain yourself, sir. <laughs> I should have asked permission before using the, the, the Knicks film school. I just figured I hadn't put out a Knicks film thread in a while. Guy made the Hall of Fame. I feel like nobody was talking about it. So I but I didn't want to just like put out a thread about Tim Hardaway without like any Knicks connection. Cause I, I, I analyzed the Knicks. So I went back, I looked on stat Muse and all of his playoff games against the Knicks. I wanted to find one that was a great game that I could also watch on YouTube and break down. And that game came up. Cause guess what? He had a lot of duds. The, it might've been the best game. I, I, did I note that he was bad against the Knicks in the playoffs? Mm -hmm. Did I note that he wasn't even a good playoff player in general? Yes, you're you, right. In our, no, you're in right. Privately to us, you did. Yeah. yeah. No, I did on the thread. I said oh, you did on the thread too. Yeah. Yeah. I said well. I shot under forty percent of his career from the, in the playoffs. He happened to have had an absurd game. Probably just, the best playoff game of his. He career. made the yeah. Hall of Fame, so I wanted to give him some love, and I tried. I tried to say I gave all the context. I said the Knicks were missing two guys because of a weird suspension. I said. I gave props to Pat Ewing, who was phenomenal in that game. I know a lot of people, I feel like people slander Pat sometimes for playoff performances. That was the simplest, easiest, most dominant, whatever he had, 37, 16, three blocks. Like it was, like he was against Alonzo Mourning. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like he was taking a walk in the park. I mean, he dominated that game. I would argue he was the best player in that game, even though Hardaway went off. But I had a lot of fun. I'm not going to lie to you. I had a lot of fun breaking it down because it was really exciting. And he was, he was talent, so but I'm sorry, things. Andrew, I didn't mean to be, I shouldn't have made you relive it. I should have done it on my own feed. So you could have just like ignored it. <laughs> no, I'm happy. I'm, I'm really happy that you did it on the next one. Listen, the I good news is most Knicks fans are like you because like 13 people watched it. <laughs> oh no, I watched it. I just wasn't going to interact with it as first of all, even though it technically would have like made our brand better. The point being, um, so I have two things to say to this. First of all, just as a general uh, observation to that game in that time, um, when we celebrated David Stern, when he finally retired, um, I think, believe in 2013. Yeah. And it was like, you know, great job on the 30 years in the NBA. Um, one of my college roommates is a Phoenix Suns fan, and we both oh. have a connection mm -hmm. in that. Yeah. Great commissioner. We hate him for a one time suspension that cost us a chance at a title. At least we believe. And he has more merit because we didn't have Mike. I had Michael Jordan to go through with the Knicks. So it's almost a pipe dream to say that that would happen. Amari Stoudemire getting suspended in 2007 but quite literally cost the Suns a title. It's funny, I always kind of thought 
I thought I feel like it's been said that the rule of stepping off the bench was like a reaction to the malice in the palace, but the Knicks thing mm-hmm. happened well before. So I guess it was always the rule, right? Yeah. It was a rule. It was a reaction to what happened literally two years before this PJ Brown, Charlie Ward fight when Greg Anthony and who was the Chicago bull that oh my God. fought during the Knicks bull series. It was uh, the 90 is 94. The conference semis oh Lord. But the fight happened and it spilled into the crowd. Oh, oh that's it was right. a nobody. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. But it like it happened right in front of Stern, too. And he was like, and this is the authoritarian, which, again, go watch the Tim Donaghy documentary. Tim uh, David Stern might actually be a godfather figure. <laughs> Having said all of that, I have a complicated relationship with David Stern as a basketball fan, because I think he he like ruined one of my favorite Knicks seasons, one of my first Knicks seasons. Um, and the other thing, Benji, all is forgiven. You apologize. And it, I just look forward to when Nick's film school expands to like other film schools and we do Yankees film school. And then mm-hmm. when David Ortiz gets inducted into the hall of fame, we'll do a full film thread on game seven of the Oh four LCS or just the entire 2004 LCS. That was mean. Very mean. I think I felt like a 24 page thread. I, I just want to say 18, 18. For, excuse for, me. The other one was 20 for my two cents. <laughs> Trevor Keels was 24. That was 24. Oh my God. <laughs> God bless you. I I appreciated it because obviously Reggie Miller. Uh, now Pete Alonso hits a home run. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> obviously, Reggie Miller was villain number one. Um, I think a lot of different people had different villain number twos. For me, it was Tim Hardaway, Jr., or Tim Hardaway Sr. I always make that mistake. Tim Hardaway Sr. was my villain number two. And it was like, I miss the age of having villains, you know, that by the way, what made it nice to have Tim Hardaway Sr. as a villain is, with the exception of that series, the Knicks always beat them. You know? Three, three straight. I said that, too. Mm-hmm. It's why that... It was it, the one time I had won, more. and you're probably yeah. right that the Knicks win that series. I do not think they beat Jordan, but I accept I that they probably win that series without the suspension. I think they were the better team. Miami was really... They, they really didn't have any good creators. Like Hardaway was a bit of a gunner. Like he was a good point guard, but I don't think he was like the, he wasn't a great playmaker, even though his assist totals were sometimes very high. I think they got swept, uh, if I recall correctly. Boston five. Alonzo oh, five. Mourning had a quote at the end of game three, we're winning on, on Monday. And then. Oh, so it was a general not, sweep. Not only did sweep. he, not only did he go off in that game, but he elbowed Scotty Pippen in the head and that Michael Jordan took that personally. And I bet he did. They won it in five. Okay. Well, that's good. Well, I'm glad you got that off your chest. Andrew. Thank yeah, you. Thanks. Bygones and bygones are bygones, Benji. No worries. Uh, Benji, anything else from you? Reggie Miller will be next. I will be putting out a 43 <laughs> part thread. That I can't stand for. <laughs> you got to start uh, with game five in 94, <laughs> and then you're going to go to game one in 95. That's right. Just shot yeah. by shot. Yep. With, with Spike Lee's reaction. Please no. Um, Ben, you're the best. Andrew, thank you as always. Everybody out there, thanks for checking out another episode of the Next Film School Podcast. We'll be back with you. More fun and games before you know it.